Uh, now we have the opportunity to have with us here uh, Dr. Ophelia uh, Garman, who is here from uh, practicing uh, medicine in um, near Atlanta, Georgia. She's been with us here this weekend. Uh, she is a board certified physician there, and she has a special interest in preventative and integrative health medicine for achieving optimal health, which is what we all want. Um, and over the last two days, uh, she's been uh, speaking to us about practical things that, uh, that we can do to help understand our body better and how to live healthier lives. Um, on the first day, she spoke about probiotics and our internal intestinal health and how that is really like our second brain. Um, and yesterday, uh, she spoke about the causes and treatments of chronic pain. Now, this uh, evening, uh, she will be speaking about anxiety, depression, and attention deficit disorder. So with that, I'd like to pass it over to Dr. Arcturia. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. It's wonderful to be here with you again. So the title of my topic today is hashtag mental health update, run on sentence. Is anybody familiar with this type of writing these days? Run on sentences, run on words. It's very popular in the social media culture. Uh, people are writing pretty funny these days. In fact, um, let's see if you know uh, what these funny shorthand uh, letters mean. A-F-A-I-K, as far as I know. These are, this is real, this, this is how people are talking on social media. Um, how about A-M-A, after my presentation. Ask me anything after my presentation. I mean that, you can ask me anything. Um, so you see that people are just um, uh, being influenced by social media to the very limits of our uh, interaction, our language, our writing, our communication. Um, the last one there is, I'm experiencing FOMO. I just learned that a few days ago, fear of missing out. Um, it's a real thing, and um, why am I starting out with um, these funny little shorthand letters? Because social media has revolutionized more than just our language and the way that we write and the way that we communicate. It has actually altered the way our brain function works. <clears throat> Mental, <clears throat> <excuse> me. <clears throat> Mental health disorders are on the rise depression, anxiety, uh, we have ADHD, eating disorders and phobias. We have so many new disorders like social media anxiety disorder. In the last 10 years, we have seen that there are multiple causes of depression. There are, of course, neurobiological uh, involving the brain um, messengers such as serotonin, which we learned on um, Friday evening is largely produced by our gut. Genetic factors um, that we inherit from our parents, mostly linked to the uh, gut flora that we inherit from our mother. Life stressors, um, such as adverse childhood events, um, low socioeconomic um, stressors in the family environmental and nutritional deficiencies. All of these can cause depression. But in college, we notice that there is a markedly increase in these um, disorders. In college students, anxiety and depression are close to 41 and 36 percent um, of a concern. College students are hurting. Uh, I, I worked for four years in college health, and depression and anxiety were, were very prominent. Um, some of them um, were worried about relationship problems, and 27% um, of college students are currently on antidepressants. Um, about 13% um, actually even um, attempt to commit suicide, and 2% attempt it. 
Uh, this is just a statistics from Ontario College. Um, however, honestly, you can cut and copy and paste any college or university name on there, and you will see the um, main concern is that our students are suffering from depression and anxiety, and we do not have the facility or the number of counselors to help them. We are at a loss. <laughs> So students can actually wait up to four weeks to get help, and that is a long time when you feel down, depressed, and a lack of hope. Um, the ratio of students to counselors are like one to six thousand. Um, so, you know, honestly, um, students that are dependent on counselors are most likely going to suffer for quite a long time. Psychologists and psychiatrists are um, naming social media and technology among the most dangerous factors for college students to develop anxiety and depression. And I'm, I'm focusing a little bit on college students. Um, however, the social media and internet um, dependency is actually also involving um, the adult population uh, so we can also include ourselves in some of these um, statistics. If you are um, social media um, savvy, um, you probably have impaired or lower social interactions and you have increased sensation of isolation, which we will talk a little bit about um, later on. We are now living in a dual virtual and reality um, lifetime. Um, most of us put more emphasis on our virtual lives than our present lives. I'm not sure if any one of you have seen or actually done this, but people will postpone starting their meal until they get their first picture of their awesome gluten-free, vegan, soy-free, organic meal. You know, and they'll post it on social media with hashtags, and you know, you'll have a really pretty picture there. So we as a society are becoming more focused on what other people think about us than what we are actually experiencing in the moment. Recently, we have had a um, new mental health um, diagnosis called social media anxiety disorder. Now, what does this mean? It is an obsession that basically leads you to feel anxious if you cannot check your Facebook or Twitter account every five minutes. Um, it is an anxiety when you feel that you are separated from your phone for a few minutes. Uh, when you feel overwhelmed, um, that you feel like you have to share everything on social media, from anything about how you woke up, uh, what you're eating, what you're doing, and who you're with. Uh, if you feel like you have to have your phone next to you every, 20, every hour of the day, um, you may have social media anxiety disorder. If you check your phone in the middle of a conversation, um, you may have social media anxiety disorder. If you are a student or if you're at work and you keep flipping from your projects um, into your social media, um, that could create um, a big distortion in your brain and how it functions. It causes confusion, it causes disorganization, and it basically interrupts um, your natural progression. Um, so as you see, um, our, our students, our children, and probably even some of us here are um, allowing technology to interfere with our reality. This is called technoference. Uh, so just to show you an example, you're a parent, a mother or a father, and you're playing with your child outside. All of a sudden you hear your phone buzzing and you know you've received a text message. You go to check your text, nothing important, the next minute you find yourself flipping through Pinterest or social media. How did you even get to social media? Because that's just habit. Um, or, you know, you see this often in the park, your child, the child is saying, mom, 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 you know, a few minutes later they're still saying, mom, mom, mom. 
And then finally, the mom is so annoyed that she's being interrupted from her phone, and she's, you know, answers very rashly, what? What do you want? Well, the internet is actually causing uh, childhood symptoms of depression and anxiety. When we allow technology to interfere between us and our parenting and our attention to our children, our children begin to internalize their feelings, their conversation, and they then transmit this internalization and develop depression and anxiety. Um, child externalization um, is presented in hyperactivity. I mean, we um, are diagnosing ADHD and ADD in children as young as four years old. Uh, children go to school and they're hyperactive. They can't control their actions, their words. Um, they might be externalizing because they are being detached. They feel a lack of connection with their parents. And what do, what do children need? They need a sense of, of, of belonging, a sense of safeness, and they need that social interaction with the only safety that they have in this world, and that is their, ch um, their parents. And so they have tantrums, and they whine, and they, they don't know what else to do to improve their communication to grab their parents' attention. So unfortunately, we are seeing this trend um, in, in even um, teenagers uh, spending 15 hours per week on social media. 210 million people estimated to be addicted to social media. Millennials check their phone about every five minutes or 150 times per day um, waking hours and about 80% need to um, sleep with their phone and actually um, check their social media throughout the night if they wake up. Um, so why is the cycle so addicting? Um, I think sometimes knowing why we're addicted to something helps us to break the cycle. So I wanted to just kind of give you an insight about why this is so prevalent in society. Um, text messages, um, updates, uh, emails, uh, all of this releases a gush of dopamine to, in the brain. The sound of our phone buzzing, um, the updates on our social media, the likes, all of that actually increases a neuronal messenger in our brain called dopamine. And so basically when we see that we're um, communicating and we're getting responses from society, we feel rewarded and our expectations are validated and we feel like our lives matter, releasing more dopamine. The problem comes when we don't feel validated, when our messages don't feel like they're important, then we are actually having um, a decrease increase in dopamine and serotonin, and we, are, um, we start to feel a little anxious. Um, the fear of missing out, again, um, basically means that we check our phone because we, f we feel like we want to be somewhere with someone else. They must be having fun without me, so you know, I'm going to check and make sure that I'm a part of this. You know, we have such high expectations from society. And when society lets us down, when we feel like we don't fit in, we, are, we develop depression. Unfortunately, we don't have high expectations of God. And if we did, we actually would spend more time trying to ask Him for help and to help us in our um, expectations and in our life. And I came across this quote that says, God will more than fulfill the highest expectations of those who put their trust in Him. So if we put our expectations in societal responses to our needs, we will, be, we will feel like a failure many times. And it happens in college students because they are so impressionable. Their minds are so fragile. But it can also happen in our adult life. But if we put our highest expectations in God, we will never be let down. And so we definitely should spend more time in prayer and reading his word that we may be able to uh, trust in him more and not in society's um, um, validation. 
Social media dependency complications, um, we have here separation anxiety. This is um, a physiological uh, cortisol release in our brain. It's a, stra a stress hormone that is released as soon as we lose our phone. If we lose our phone, it's like we're losing our brain because our phone has everything. All our phone numbers, it has directions, it has notes, messages, and so we are not memorizing anything. It's all on our phone. Phantom rings, this is a um, biological, physical uh, sensation that we feel on our skin um, that we think that we are being addressed through our social media or our phone. Uh, so you could be, um, you know, you keep your phone in your pocket, you can be walking, you feel like your phone is buzzing on, on your skin, so you check it. It's nothing. Um, you know, I, I now have um, an eye watch. It happens all the time. I'm walking. I feel like my hand is buzzing. I look. There's nothing. There's no call. This is called phantom rings. Um, the second biological change that social media is, um, is um, performing in us is insomnia. Um, we are spending more time in the evening on our devices. The um, light that we are, the LED light that we are looking at is actually suppressing melatonin in our brain and it is causing insomnia in us and our children. And of course we know that lack of sleep is um, bad for our memory, um, it's bad for how we feel and our mood. So uh, it's definitely a cause for anxiety and depression as well as ADD. Um, so what else does uh, social media cause? Well, uh, studies have shown that those who have 300 friends or more on social media have higher cortisol levels. And what is cortisol again? You remember? It's a stress hormone. So kids, I mean teenagers, on average have about a thousand friends on social media. And you know, you probably have close to 500 or 300. Uh, but the more friends you have, the more cortisol is in your bloodstream. And so when our adrenal glands continue to secrete this cortisol level on a daily level, it is basically getting tired and it doesn't have enough reserve for when you actually do have a stressful situation. So you hyper respond and can't actually respond appropriately. How about in children? Um, the addiction uh, to the screen is actually starting now in, in children as, as young as three years old. Um, you know, about 42% of children ages eight already have their own iPad, and um, the average time spent on the screen is two hours and 20 minutes. Um, and currently the recommendations now for screen time is um, less than an hour and hopefully even less. Uh, you know, our children during the first seven years of their life need to have not only social interaction um, with you, the family, their friends, they have to have um, interaction with nature. Um, there is, um, you know, a, a book called um, uh, deficiency in vitamin N. Our children are not being exposed to the outdoors. They aren't playing with rocks. They aren't playing with dirt. They don't have any idea how fruits and vegetables are grown, the process of life, and so, you know, their ability to even appreciate um, life in general is diminished. And so the more time children are outdoors and actually interacting uh, with nature, the better their life will be, and the better their brain and their memory and their intelligence will be when they are older. Uh, so the big picture is that these kids are being affected socially, emotionally, and intelligently, negatively. Uh, YouTube is probably the most widely watched by children. Um, children like to be in charge. Um, so just again, if you're a parent or a grandparent, um, this is why addiction to YouTube occurs. Children like to be in charge. They like to drive uh, what's going on. So they like to click and choose the videos that they're watching, forming an addiction in our toddlers. So cortisol is the stress hormone that is increased 
especially in the morning by 50 percent, 30 minutes be, um, after waking up. So just think about it. If your cortisol level um, increases within 30 minutes of waking up, and then you check your social media as soon as you open your eyes or wake up out of bed, and you see a negative um, post, you see a negative comment, or you feel like there is a lack of validation to your post, what do you think that will do to your cortisol level? It will increase it even more. And so that sensation of anxiety is actually reproduced and it's actually fed. So that basically um, is a really bad way to start your day. With cortisol level naturally being increased, um, 30 minutes of waking up, probably the best thing that you can do is pray, um, read um, positive books, the Bible, something positive that will actually help you with the challenges of the coming day. And so through this, you are able to uh, deal with the stressors and the anxiety, and you won't feel so anxious. Well, let's see what are some of the things that can um, increase our regular cortisol level. Stress at work, right? You're, we're stressed at work. Um, we have a childhood um, abuse or emotional abuse, physical trauma, uh, injuries, chronic sleep deprivation, um, infections, hospitalizations, uh, problems with our gut. So uh, here again, we have the gut and brain connection. If your flora in your gut is lacking and imbalanced, your brain and cortisol levels will also be affected. Of course, uh, inflammatory diseases, uh, immunological diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, all of that can actually affect your cortisol. Um, toxins in your blood from uh, your food and your environment. Uh, of course, nutritional vitamin deficiencies, uh, food intolerances, again, um, kind of going to the uh, gut again, and hormone imbalance, thyroid, um, estrogen, progesterone, um, and genetics. So these are all things that can actually affect how our body secrete cortisol and can affect our adrenal glands. There is a gaming um, mania going on in our society. Have you ever heard of gaming? It's a trend that um, basically means that you play video games and you probably just keep on playing it. Instead of doing useful things around the house or interacting with your family members, you isolate yourself and you play video games. Uh, most of these video games are quite um, violent in nature. Um, you take the role of a shooter or, um, you know, a action uh, figure, and it's quite popular. Uh, unfortunately, it's, you know, popular among teenagers as well as adults. And this, too, forms an addiction called Internet Gaming Disorder. Well, these games actually increase your cortisol level because you are in an active shooting. You are at, in an active, uh, violent situation where you feel like you have to escape or you feel like you have to catch up or you feel like you have to win. Um, this leads to frustration. This leads to um, so many other um, physical and uh, biological um, symptoms. Uh, basically, uh, science has mentioned that if you spend more than 30 hours per week gaming, you have an increased risk of depression and um, suicide as well. How about television and children? Um, television uh, and movies and shows for, for kids can also be quite stimulating. And our young children really should not be exposed to this. Um, Really, the rapid changes in um, all of the clips, the music, um, all of this to their tiny little brains is very stimulating. And then this actually increases cortisol level 
and it suppresses their frontal cortex. The frontal cortex of the brain is really the judgment seat. It's the morality. It's uh, basically what helps you um, have a good conscience. When this is suppressed in a child, they are no longer receptive to a parental communication of what's right and wrong, and they actually have even a lack of attention or focus. So, yeah, 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 mom, whatever, I can't even focus, um, setting your children up for future ADD and ADHD and cognitive decline. Again, so the um, American Academy of Family Physician is really um, no longer advocating, uh, it used to be at least two hours, no more, but now it's actually decreased to one hour. And really, they are saying that before the age of, um, between birth and three years old, a child should not even be watching television um, or um, any medium. Um, <clears throat> some of the potential risk factors for children who um, begin to uh, feel this addiction um, increase sedentary time. They're sitting all day long. They don't want to go outside. Um, outside is really not exciting. It's pretty boring. Um, you know, there's nothing going on. There's nothing really moving. They actually have to be involved. They want to be f um, stimulated um, in a very uh, passive way. It encourages this isolation versus socialization. So children don't need to find a friend or play with somebody because they are already being entertained. Um, and it suppresses emotion. Um, so you're watching um, games and you actually play games uh, to release your tension. Well, guess what? You're not releasing your tension if you're playing games. You're actually um, suppressing them instead of releasing them. Uh, potential future health risks, eating disorders. If you're constantly sitting watching shows or watching your iPad or on social media, you are just um, tending to eat. Um, so you nibble on things and develop a um, eating disorder, which then makes you um, have low self-esteem and possibly depression and anxiety. Studies in Japan also noted that children who spend time on social media have decline in their vision. And so, of course, if you're spending late nights watching your screen or staring at it, you're going to develop um, or have a higher risk of nearsightedness. And we already mentioned the um, increase of insomnia. So, social isolation um, can actually be detrimental and increase cortisol level. Um, we, we know that solitary confinement in prison have been a form of punishment for many, many years. Um, and they have noticed that solitary confinement in prisoners can, action, can actually alter your brain cells, your brain synapses or the connections, blood flow and the nervous system. So our brain cannot function without social interactions. We need them like air and water. And so could it be that if we are dependent upon our phones or our uh, technological devices, rather than socializing, we are actually self-inflicting solitary confinement and therefore inflicting cruel and unusual punishment on our brain. So as far as um, cortisol level, uh, if our children are experiencing these negative adverse effects, little by little, fragmented as they may be from their parents, from their um, cohorts, this sets them up for future cortisol deficiency and depression in adulthood. So again, we um, discussed about the multiple things that can affect our cortisol. Um, stresses and uh, stressors come in so many ways, physical, mental, psychological, environmental. And you can feel very frustrated because you don't know why you feel this way and how you can get out of this cycle. You need to address the root cause you need to start holistic treatment. So let's kind of take a look a little bit on how this treatment would look like, shall we? 
So of course, uh, depending on the stage of your cortisol levels or your adrenal gland function, uh, we would start um, doing some labs, of course, and doing some nutritional alteration with uh, support by fresh foods and vegetables, unprocessed. Um, we would, of course, do some um, supplementation with um, nutraceuticals, botanical, um, adrenal gland, uh, and very rarely, hormonal replacement. So let's look at an example. A 54-year-old man has symptoms like depression, progressive fatigue, low motivation, difficulty waking up, um, and he just doesn't feel like he can get going. He works long hours, he doesn't really exercise because he has a lack of motivation, and he just doesn't feel like he's keeping up with the stressors of work like he used to. His memory is not that sharp, and he really um, doesn't feel like um, he is cognitively keeping up. Fairly healthy, a little bit of low back pain in his history. He's not on any kind of medication. So with him, of course, we would probably do some labs if possible. Um, in a person like this who is busy working long hours, they're probably not eating very many vegetables. So we're going to increase his um, vegetable intake, 10 servings of vegetables per day um, with two uh, servings of fruits. We're going to increase his dietary fiber with all these fruits and vegetables, um, trying for a goal of 35 grams per day. And we're going to optimize his minerals <clears throat> with zinc, chromium, and selenium. So zinc is important for wound healing, but it's also really good for your immune system. It's really necessary for your adrenal glands. Uh, <clears throat> chromium is also very um, helpful. It actually can um, support your um, uh, can actually help with chronic inflammation in your gut and um, it's also very good um, to decrease or help your body handle glucose and insulin and process carbohydrates. So chromium deficiency can um, increase your risk for developing diabetes and cardiovascular disease. <laughs> Selenium is a very good mineral that helps um, to reduce your free radicals. So we spoke fairly extensively about the um, oxidative uh, stress that we are experiencing, and selenium is very good to help reduce that. Um, we would put him on a multivitamin, probably some B12 shots, um, high dose, some B complex that has um, all your B vitamins, vitamin C, of course, CoQ10. Uh, glutathione support, again, is very important um, to help with your um, oxidative stress. Uh, Omega-3 fatty acids are so important for neurological support. Uh, studies have shown that um, even um, People in uh, prison who have had violent um, outbreaks, if they are on a high omega-3 fatty acids, they see improvement. And some um, supplements that help with supporting your adrenal glands, like licorice and ginseng. Um, hormonal support would um, probably focus on a couple of hormones, like uh, pregnenolone, which will increase your energy, and DHEA. Um, rarely will you need cortisol or Cortef unless for really severe cases of fibromyalgia and very temporarily we would take you off very quickly. Uh, so lifestyle modification that um, I would recommend is light to moderate and not intense exercise. Intense exercise is very, um, is very stressful on the body and it can increase a high dose of cortisol. So if you have problem losing weight and you feel like you've been running and getting your heart rate up, um, that's probably not the right type of exercise for you. Um, so light to moderate walking, stretching um, is always very good and very light um, weight bearing exercises. Prayer and meditation on God's word um, helps again to decrease um, your uh, cortisol level, it increases your dopamine level and your happy hormones, it's very relaxing, it can predispose you to better aptitude uh, to deal with the stressors of the day. So I definitely recommend that. 
You need also, I, I really recommend, 10 to 15 minutes of self-reflection in the morning. Um, get yourself prepped up. Make sure that you have a timeline. Get organized with your day. What are, what are your goals for the day? What are the things you want to do? Um, that way you kind of have an outline of what to expect. Um, you're not, you know, aimlessly going throughout your day, um, wasting your time. So you become more efficient, and efficiency always increases and improves your um, self-respect, um, and you feel more affirmed. Social interaction is very important. Studies show that people who don't receive touch, hugs, um, and who do not socially interact, smile and laugh and talk, have reduced, reduced um, healing time after heart attacks and strokes, and actually have increased risk for depression and anxiety. So join a church, uh, go to meetings, you know, I feel, I feel like I wish I were here for the cooking class coming up. Um, I've been to a few cooking classes and they're so much fun because you get to actually um, learn something healthy, you maybe even have some hands-on, and you actually learn um, something really good. Um, so church groups are really great to join, um, and just um, overall positive uh, social interactions. So um, <clears throat> omega-3, again, um, I just wanted to um, touch a little bit about, we've heard of omega-6 this weekend. Um, intake of omega-6 to omega-3 uh, is drastically um, elevated, um, mainly due to our high excessive free oils. And so this can actually have um, a neuropsychiatric consequence. So make sure that we are reducing that um, as well. Um, stool biomarkers, if you have the ability to get a stool sample to see if your stool has any inflammatory markers, um, to see if maybe you're lacking on some digestive enzymes, uh, pancreatic insufficiency, pancreatic enzymes, um, I would highly suggest that you do so. Uh, they can check if you have any form of GI inflammation through this hormone called fecal cal um, calprotectin. Um, they can actually check if you have an allergic component. Um, and if you do, that might be causing your source of inflammation. Um, they can check your stool for bleeding and see if you're, you know, possibly having some um, anemia. They can check to see if you have infections. Um, there are certain microbes that you definitely don't want to have, like C. difficile and H. pylori. Um, if you do have H. pylori, you can have a sense of bloating and um, acidity and pain after eating. And so that would definitely be something you want to get checked. And of course, the stool study can check to see if you have a balanced flora and um, direct you in the right probiotic treatment and therapy for you. Um, as far as a self-directed um, digestive um, experiment, um, you can do this. Um, if you can't afford a stool study, as they can probably be fairly expensive, um, you know, many immunologists and allergists and even uh, gastroenterologists are recommending that their patients um, completely eliminate certain food groups like gluten, dairy, soy, eggs, <clears throat> corn, pork, beef, chicken, uh, certain beans and lentils, coffee, citrus fruits, nuts, and nightshade vegetables like eggplant. And so you're removing all of these foods from your diet for at least four weeks. Now you can also do it, there's another form of doing an elimination diet by choosing a fruits and vegetables based on colors. So yellow fruits and vegetables, orange, red, um, green. And by eliminating these and then introducing them after four weeks on a slow basis, then you can see if your digestion and the way you feel is changing um, when you're reintroducing them. So it's a self-directed experiment. It's pretty cheap um, and there's no harm. It's a little harder to do in children, um, you know, especially ages three, four. Uh, and unfortunately, there are children who suffer from severe allergies at that age and they would benefit from such a diet, but children are just so prone to nutritional deficiency that it becomes a little complicated. 
So here's um, our patient. Um, he decided to have a cortisol test. And um, 30 minutes after waking up, his cortisol level <clears throat> was only 15. And expected is 50%. <clears throat> so obviously through this um, graph, you see that he rapidly has a decrease in his cortisol by 11 o'clock in the morning. So you can see why he's feeling really tired and he can't keep up at work and he's feeling exhausted. And by <clears throat> Just um, for, for um, completion's sake, may I mention that this is a saliva cortisol test and not a blood cortisol test. Uh, saliva cortisol is much more specific um, and much more um, trustworthy with regards to um, the therapy uh, modalities that you want to do. So he, <clears throat> of course, accepted the dietary changes, the exercise, and the lifestyle. Um, he was taking some adaptogens and vitamins and minerals. And three months later, we see here that his cortisol level increased to 62. <clears throat> so where did we go from there? Well, once um, you notice that your cortisol level is at optimal level um, and is now ready to function, uh, you start to reduce some of the um, adaptogens and the, pharmace uh, the nutraceuticals and the um, biological treatments and you may even choose to discontinue and monitor again. So as far as our um, health, our mental health, you know, we've touched upon a few things that are affecting us in um, our, our day and age. Social media has definitely made an impact. Do we have to allow it to impact us negatively? Absolutely not. There are positives to that. But we have to control the way we allow it to impact our lives. We have noticed that there are so many things that can lead to depression and anxiety. And we need to um, pinpoint these causes. And the only way to do that is to look at our history, to look at our, our patterns of eating, of sleeping, of uh, responses. And we need to be patient in, uh, in our treatment. Sometimes it can be three months later. Sometimes it could be eight months. Um, but healing takes time. And it really takes a very holistic approach. Rather than just taking an antidepressant or an anti-anxiety medication, which can act as a crutch temporarily, but really is not helping with the situation. So my goal and um, my wish for you is that you may um, take some of the things that we've mentioned here, uh, do a little bit more research on, on it, maybe find a local functional medicine doctor who is open to using nutraceuticals, uh, botanical treatments, um, who is open to thinking outside the box, like I've mentioned before. And hopefully this may um, help you and uh, encourage you to reduce some of the things that you can control that are stressing you out and that are isolating you and that are increasing yours and your children's risk of depression and anxiety. Eliminate those and try to live more in harmony and peace and um, eliminate depression and anxiety from your life. Thank you.